Well, good morning. Happy almost 4th of July. Hey, if, um, if you're looking next to you and someone's missing, go ahead and text them and say you better be in church. That's what I'm saying. We are in, uh, still in our series, the, the I Love My Church series, and today we're talking about the value we have as a come-as-you-are attitude for a church. And I'm so glad to see all of you and uh, everyone that is online with us uh, at the Back 40, iCampus, Facebook Live, Honduras. Uh, we are just so glad you're here with us. As I was getting ready for this message, I was reminded of a story of a young pastor, uh, Pastor Mike, who, where he worked, the church he worked at, was given the task of visiting uh, shut-ins for the church. And on this occasion, he was out doing that, and he came to Mary Franklin's house, knocking on the door. She answered, thrilled to see Pastor Mike there. Invited him in, I had him sit in the living room, and she just wanted to make Pastor Mike some tea. Now, Pastor Mike doesn't really care for tea, but he would allow you know, to, her to do that because that would make her happy. And so she says, I'll be right back, and she goes off to make tea. As Pastor Mike is sitting there, he notices on the table there is a bowl of almonds there. And he is feeling a little hungry, so he figures he'll take a few of those and he'll eat those. Well, it is taking Mary quite a long time to get the tea together and get back. And uh, my, Pastor Mike realizes he has eaten quite a few of the almonds that are in the bowl. And uh, he's feeling a bit guilty. And uh, Mary comes back with the tea, sets it all down, serves it. And Mike has a little moment of confession. And he says, Mary... I need to apologize because I have unknowingly really eaten the majority of all your almonds. And she says, oh, Pastor Mike, that is okay. These days, the only thing I can really do is suck the chocolate off. <laughs> all right. Got a little reel for you there. Right. But you'll be telling it at your parties. I know you will. We have already talked about how we value missional risk takers and excellence in what we do and about relevant truth and how that applies to our lives and how we live. And so let me set the scene for you this morning of where we're heading. Uh, we're heading into the parable of the Good Samaritan. Real quick, uh, just a quick survey. How many of you know this story? Raise your hand. Yeah, the majority. We do know what it means or what is implied when someone says, oh, he or she is a Good Samaritan. Well, here's the scene. Jesus had just sent his disciples out in pairs of two. And they're coming back from that journey and sharing with him what they encountered. They were out sharing his message, sharing the message about the kingdom of God. And in this particular instance, they are sitting around in a larger group, uh, just kind of catching up, sharing, and talking about uh, God stuff. Now, Jesus has been in conflict with the Pharisees. And they have been trying to discredit him. And at one point in Jesus' ministry, he begins to solely uh, teach his disciples in the form of parables. And where we can see the beginning of some of that is in Mark chapter 2. There are five occasions in that chapter where Jesus comes into conflict with religious leaders. Now, since his miracles are so powerful, in order to try to discredit him, they are now making the case that his power comes from Satan. And they keep showing up. And in this particular story, we will see that happen again. So what begins the story for us this morning? And by the way, that is in 1040, 1040, page 1040 in your Bibles, in your seats. Luke chapter 10, starting at verse 25. What begins the story for us? is a question from a lawyer. Anybody else like questions from lawyers? Just checking. All right. It comes a question from a lawyer. At verse 25, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Now, the lawyer knows all about Old Testament law. If you want to know something about Old Testament law, ins and outs, and whatever you might be looking for, this is the kind of guy you would go to to find that out. And this lawyer seems to be respectful toward Jesus. Don't know if that's just a ruse or if he really is since he called him teacher. 
Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? In other words, what do I have to do to live forever? That is his question. And this is not the first time that Jesus has had to answer this question. 19 times within Scripture, Jesus is put with, put to, with this question in front of him. What must I do to live forever? Now here's how Jesus answers him in the next verse. What is written in the law? Question mark. Okay, lawyer. What is written in the law? How do you read it? Is how Jesus replies. You're a lawyer, well learned in the law. What do you think it says? And the lawyer responds. He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. The lawyer has answered correctly. Jesus tells him, you have answered correctly. He is answered by giving the letter of the law answer to Jesus. Remember Jesus asked him, what, how do you read it? He gives him strictly the answer on the page. And Jesus replies to him, do this and you will live. You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. The lawyer has answered based on the letter of the law, but his question is, for, however, flawed. There is nothing that you and I can do to inherit eternal life. Eternal life is a gift from God. To think that we can do something that would usher us into the kingdom of God is just being dishonest with ourselves. Now Jesus is answering him in a way that points him to what he would know. The law, Leviticus 18. Jesus points him to that. It's not going to be on the screen. Let me read it to you. In Leviticus 18, you must obey my laws and be careful to follow my decrees. I am the Lord your God. Keep my decrees and laws, for the person who obeys them will live by them. I am the Lord. So he challenges the lawyer to this. If you want to answer by the letter of the law, and you want to have eternal life, then go and do that, and you'll live. Here's the problem. We are not capable of keeping all of his laws and his decrees, decrees flawlessly. See, if you're taking this route, the, the minute that this tall, blonde-headed, silver-bearded, big dude cuts in front of you at the ice cream line, and you get mad, you're done. You're done. The minute you look to your neighbor and covet something your neighbor has, you're done. No eternal life. And God knows that we cannot maintain this, therefore, He intervenes. Now, the lawyer, wanting to justify himself, takes another run at Jesus here. He's kind of like, yeah, really not the answer I was looking for. And it makes me feel a little bit foolish, so let me try this again. And he tells Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And who is my neighbor? Now we've come to the real question. It's not the most important question. We know the most important question is about eternity. However, this second question sets us up for our discussion today. Who is my neighbor? And once we get to this point now, Jesus begins to tell a story. 
And he replies to the lawyer this way. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. When he was attacked by robbers, they stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. This journey, uh, when we read in the Bible, we read, you know, coming down from Jerusalem, going up to Jerusalem. And this journey between Jerusalem and Jericho is about 17 miles. And Jerusalem is about 3,000 feet above sea level. Jericho is down. And so therefore, going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. uh, And it's a winding, uh, deserted kind of looking path. And it has a history of people being robbed, beaten, and murdered on it because there are so many places to hide and jump people. So just to illustrate that, I need three people to volunteer this morning uh, to beat up someone I pick at random. Ten people stood up. No, not really. It's a treacherous place. It has a history of People being hurt on it. And so this is a really prevalent story that Jesus is beginning to share with the people around him. They understand this reality. And he goes on to say, A priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. Two prominent Jewish religious leaders within the temple are shown in this story to pass by a person in need, desperate need. Jesus is truly beginning to set this story in a framework unexpected to the hearer. The Jewish hero of the time would have expected, here comes the hero of the story, the priest or the Levite. But the pastor and the music minister have walked on by. And then he releases this beautiful framework. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, He took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. Don't miss this part. He didn't drop him off. He checked in. He spent the night taking care of him. And the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. The Samaritan becomes the hero of the story. And for the Jews, this is a problem. Samaritans were despised by the Israelites. They were despised by the Jews. They were half-breeds seen as less than. They wouldn't even go through their territory. And Jesus makes the Samaritan the champion, the hero of this story. And then he poses this question to the lawyer, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? Well, the expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. Who is our neighbor? I get to look at this grid for a moment. We don't have time to do it here, but let me. You are in the center block. That's you. That's your house in the center. And to the right, left, back, front, all that are your neighbors. And so the the work here is to to fill in the blocks around your house with what you know about the neighbors, their names, etc. And what you know about them. For some of you, those homes are within 25 feet of your home. 
And if your grid doesn't have a crazy neighbor, because we know we have crazy neighbors, right? So if your grid doesn't have a crazy neighbor, you're probably the crazy neighbor. <laughs> I would love to unpack the whole thing for you. I and, and for me, I'm just in a new neighborhood, just beginning to learn that. Uh, but I'll change the name to protect the innocent. Uh, my neighbor, Frank, I, I moved in uh, and I cut down his tree, his Buckeye tree. I thought it was on city land and it was his. And Frank is a Ohio State Buckeyes fan. To which he promptly asked me if I was a Michigan fan. So I bought him a sweatshirt. No, I didn't. I said, I'll buy you a new tree. That's how I met a neighbor. Yeah, who's the crazy neighbor? All right. <laughs> this is the beginning. Fill out this grid. What do you know about who lives nearby you? Maybe you don't want to. Keep listening. Keep listening to the words of Jesus. Now, some of you live on some acreage, and you're probably going, ah, people don't live near me. They do. They're just farther away. Your job's a little harder. If you fill out these blocks, you might find that a neighbor could tell you a story of rejection and hurt. Another could tell you the story of a boy who sits alone in his room because his dad brings home the paycheck but ignores him otherwise. A block on your grid could tell you that there's a neighbor, a young girl watching TV late at night once again because her mother has lied, lying passed out against, again on the floor. Another might tell you the story of someone who has received the pink slip because their company is downsizing and yet another could speak to a doctor's diagnosis that brings the result that is not promising at all. Those could be the stories within your grid. People get a hurt. People get hurt unexpectedly and need treatment. And in the text, the man didn't know that people were going to come out of nowhere, beat him, take all of his stuff, and leave him half dead to die. It happened unexpectedly. And he needed help. Wounded, hurting people need a place to come where they can come hurt and banged up and find healing. The church is to be that place. The Valley Church needs to be that kind of place. And if you are here this morning and you are hurting and you have been banged up by life, and you feel as if there is just no hope in that, I hope you will begin to engage with us and keep coming and keep coming and find the love of God's people and the love of a Savior who heals and redeems. Presently, nearly half of those persons between the ages of 18 and 34 come from broken homes. A majority of those come from abusive and otherwise dysfunctional backgrounds. According to statistics, every day 13 young people commit suicide. 16 are murdered. 1,000 become mothers. 2,200 drop out of schools. And 500 begin using drugs of some sort. These are the walking wounded, and this does not begin to count those who are addicted to alcohol and sex and other things. They need a place where they can go for emergency help to be introduced to the one who heals and restores. In this story, there are two real surprises. We've really touched on them, but the first is that those who are listening expect their leaders, their religious leaders, to respond with compassion surely these leaders loved God more than anyone else and his people yet they were more concerned with their purity than people more concerned with their comfort 
than compassion. And the second is the bigger surprise is the one who did respond in love and compassion was despised, was a despised outsider. The Samaritan, he swung into action. He decided he was on call. He was the one that would provide emergency treatment for this man battered and bruised. He would provide compassion and empathy and love. Could we be a place where people can come find healing? A place where people swing into action to bring help that's needed. A church that is not a museum for the perfect, but a church for healing people is their primary business. Understand when I talk about healing people, it is the healer himself through you that heals. What God can do through you and I is the healing power. What can you and I do to be on call, to be part of a healing process in someone's life? One thing, to act out of compassion, not judgment. You and I need to act out of compassion, not judgment. From the story, he saw him and he had compassion for him. The word for compassion in the Greek means being so moved with concern for something or someone that you can't help but take action. To act out of compassion, you and I must identify with someone who is hurting and wounded. We must come alongside him or her. To offer care, compassion, empathy, and love, you and I first are first going to have to build a relationship with people. Invite them into your life. Befriend them. And invite them into the life of Jesus' church. Just like he invited you. Romans 15, 7. So warmly welcome each other into the church. Just as Christ has warmly welcomed you. Then God will be glorified. Think about offering to someone to come be part of the church and that is how God gets glorified because you reached out and you said, hey, come be part of His church. Come be part of what's happening there because God could be glorified in that. Our family has been watching ER together 16 seasons folks 16 seasons that's some big material the thing about an ER it struck me ERs are trauma centers and they care for anyone who comes to them and when you go to an ER they are interested in how they are going to bring healing as quickly as possible to what's happening to you. Anyone who needs care gets it. And the church should be just like that. The valley should be just like that. The difference, while an ER accepts anyone who comes to them, they do not necessarily love the people they treat. This is the one thing that the church must do that a trauma center does not Love for people is what makes us different. Love is the one thing that makes us truly Christian in a post-Christian world. C.S. Lewis was asked once, theologian, he's a theologian, a writer, an evangelist, an apologist. C.S. Lewis was once asked, 
uh, to, in one word, explain the difference between Christianity and all of the other worldviews. And he said, that is simple. It is grace. Grace. And, and what is grace if it's not love? I'd like to share a video with you that speaks to this idea. You've been accused of practicing medicine without a license. It's a very grave charge, son. Are you aware that it's unlawful to practice medicine without a medical license? Yes, sir, I am. Are you aware that running a medical clinic without the proper licensing can place both you and the public in a great deal of danger? Is a home a clinic, sir? If you are admitting patients and treating them, physical location is irrelevant. Yes, sir. Will you define treatment for me? Yes, treatment would be defined as the care of a patient seeking medical attention. Have you been treating patients, Mr. Adams? Well, sir, I live with several people. They come and go as they please. I offer them whatever help I can. Mr. Adams, have you or have you not been treating patients at your ranch? Everyone who comes to the ranch is a patient, yes. And every person who comes to the ranch is also a doctor. I'm sorry. Every person who comes to the ranch is in need of some form of physical or mental help. They're patients. But also every person who comes to the ranch is in charge of taking care of someone else. Whether it's cooking for them, cleaning them, or even a simple task as listening. That makes them doctors. I use that term broadly, gentlemen, but is not a doctor someone who helps someone else? When did the term doctor get treated with such reverence as, oh, right this way, Dr. Smith, or, excuse me, Dr. Scholl, no what wonderful foot pads, or... <laughs> at what point in history did a doctor become more than a trusted and learned friend who visited and treated the ill? Now, you ask me if I've been practicing medicine. Well, if this means opening your door to those in need, those in pain, caring for them, listening to them, applying a cold cloth until a fever breaks. If this is practicing medicine, if this is treating a patient, then I am guilty as charged, sir. Did you consider the ramifications of your actions? What if one of your patients had died? What's wrong with death, sir? What are we so mortally afraid of? Why can't we treat death with a certain amount of humanity and dignity and decency and, God forbid, maybe even humor? Death is not the enemy, gentlemen. If we're going to fight a disease, let's fight one of the most terrible diseases of all, indifference. Now, I've sat in your schools and heard people lecture on transference and professional distance. Transference is inevitable, sir. Every human being has an impact on another. Why don't we want that in a patient-doctor relationship? That's why I've listened to your teachings, and I believe they're wrong. A doctor's mission should be not just to prevent death, but also to improve the quality of life. That's why you treat a disease, you win, you lose. You treat a person, I guarantee you, you win, no matter what. If people are going to risk themselves and open up to us to receive love and healing in every area of their lives, then we must create a certain kind of environment where they are guaranteed three things. The first one is love without exception. When we love people, when people matter so much that we swing into action to meet their needs, then we are loving without exception. In the story, the man asked, who is my neighbor? Who, shall, who should ask, what we should ask as well, who am I to love? And the answer is people, no matter the wounds or the current condition or state in jesus they will find healing wholeness love and compassion because we have a savior who is alive who does heal who does restore who does protect who does love you who does want to be with you we have a savior who does all of those things for us now you should have clapped there he is an awesome 
awesome Savior. How will you and I know that we really love people when it costs us something? When it costs us something. To love people will cost you something. To love people may take your reputation, time, money, and belongings. But loving someone is exactly what your Lord and Savior has shown you and what He calls you and I to. Both patient and doctor. Not because you have the wisdom, but because through Him, in you, you can bring healing to another. And don't mistake the fact that you still need it. The second is acceptance without reservation. Jesus spent His time with the lost and the wounded. When lost and wounded people find someone who will love them and accept them with their wounds, you won't be able to keep them away. When I think of the reasons the Levite and the priest didn't stop to help the wounded man, is they didn't want to get involved. They didn't want to get messy. And when men and women come into the ER bleeding all over the place, they're not saying, hey, stop making a mess. They move into action to help them, to heal them. They're not there to keep the place all nice and clean every moment. They are there to provide care for wounded people. And the third item, forgiveness without hesitation. Forgiveness without hesitation. Well, how can that be? Because we are told in Ephesians 4.32, be kind and compassionate to one another and forgive each other just as Christ, as in Christ God forgave you. Just as in Christ God forgave you. Sometimes the tendency for us is to judge other people. Particularly those who have gotten themselves into some difficult predicament. If they hadn't messed up their relationships, their marriage, if they hadn't started drinking or started, started smoking pot or taking heroin or hanging around with the wrong people, if they just wouldn't have done that, they would have been just fine. I'm not one of those people. I praise God that He doesn't act and feel that way towards us. I'm not saying that we overlook someone's sin because that's not what we do. We cannot overlook sin. Sin needs to be dealt with because it is part of the healing process of where we're heading. So we don't overlook it. We actually, we address it. For the church is the church not only when it claims to love God, but when it shows that love to hurting and wounded people. The church is a loving and healing center for wounded people because they can come just as they are. And that is a core value for the Valley Church. Let me give you an illustration for that. Bob Lyon, Lyon is a professor at Asbury Seminary. And Bob was getting ready to retire and some of his friends decided it would be awesome if they could collect students and friends that would come and enjoy that retirement time with him. And they were really surprised when so many people responded to come. And on that day, these people came together and Bob sat in his recliner and everyone was sharing about how Bob had impacted their lives. As things had settled a little bit, a woman towards the back raised her hand and said, I would like to say something. And she was a rather large woman, uh, not overly attractive, but she said, hey, she says, Bob, you don't remember me or know me, but you changed my life. 
Her name was Jane. And Jane had spent a lifetime of hearing negative things about her emotionally and physically and carried that weight and those wounds with her in life. And she got to the point where she was afraid to even go out into life. Through some miracle of God, she decided to pursue courses at Asbury Seminary. And on her first day, she knew no one at this place. She was heading towards the cafeteria. And as she was heading in, Bob Lyons was heading out. And Bob, moved by the Spirit, saw this girl coming in and walked over to her, interrupted her, and, and gave her a hug. And then backed up and said... God thinks you are beautiful. And that was it. She never took a class from Bob Lyons. Nothing. Never talked to him. Never shared. They never really uh, talked to each other again. And she went on her way. But in that one final act, she was sharing that that changed the course of her life. That from that one moment... This young lady went on to graduate and to begin three, not one, but three orphanages that dealt and supplied care and need for children who were in that same kind of environment, who suffered at the hands of the same kind of wounds. One act of compassion. One point of hearing God's word spoken to you can make a difference. can change a life. And you may be sitting here today thinking nobody understands what I'm going through, but there is someone who does. Maybe you're like Jane. You're hurting on the inside and you're hiding or you're keeping it all inside and God thinks that you are amazing and you matter to Him. How do you know that, Peter? You, God, have seen my tossing and turning through the night. You have collected all my tears and preserved them in your bottle. God understands and not a tear has fallen from your eye that he doesn't know about. No one understands my life, my pain, my hurt, my addiction. God does. He understands. And He wants to bring healing to your life. Scripture tells us, but He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our sins. And by His stripes we are healed. This is the God that we serve. This is the God who loves me, who loves you. This is the God who is so real and tangible that when you need to feel His love, He sends His Spirit to surround you. When you need His healing, He sends it in so many different ways. Can I just tell you this? That we are Christians, and if we believe in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, then we live the unstoppable life. Whether God heals me or takes me home, I have won. Yes. Because that sounded like wow to me. That's the power of the God we serve. The God who comes because life can be hard. And there is a great physician. There is a great healer. And when you come to the ER that is his church, it should show you compassion and give you empathy and show you how to be healed no matter what. As we get ready to leave, believe that you have a healer. That you have a Lord and Savior who loves you and would do anything for you because he's proven that time and time again he is your healer he supplies all your needs and i don't want to leave you on a down note because that's not what we're about i want you to rejoice in the fact that you are a people who believe in the the lord and savior and you are free and you give him a hand clap of praise this morning because that is where you live that is where you need to be and that's what you need to understand and we need to give it to whoever comes through those doors
So go in peace today and understand we have our good and powerful God. Have a great week. Thank you for joining the Valley Church today. We invite you to experience our worship celebration in person each Sunday at one of our campuses located in either Pickwell or Troy. Services at our campuses begin at 9.15 and 11 a.m. and the dress is always casual. You can learn more about the Valley's wide range of activities, programs, and services by visiting us on the web at thevalley.church. You can also join us weekly each Sunday online at our iCampus or through Facebook Live by clicking those buttons on our website at thevalley.church. People of all ages can experience the excitement and the joy of being part of a growing church that is truly on God's mission, a church where you can belong and discover your purpose in life. We hope to see you soon.